It was 80s sitcoms that taught me one of life's great truths. Success is defined by owning a pinball machine. My parents, as you might imagine, had a different definition. Now that I find myself without parental constraint and with some spare room in my garage, I'm confronted by a new voice, my own. And it says, there's no reason to buy a pinball machine if you don't know anyone who can fix it. Determined to keep the last thread of my childhood ambitions intact, I set out to locate someone who could repair pinball machines, should I ever decide to buy one. It didn't take long before rumors of a legendary pinball repairman known as the Pinball Pirate began to surface. A few phone calls later, and I discovered this swashbuckling superhero was due to be at the Pacific Pinball Museum in Alameda, California for an upcoming fix-it night. Alameda is not far, I thought, so I packed some film gear and set sail for the museum. After securing entry to the establishment, I began my search for the pirate. I ran into museum director Michael Sheets, who told me the pirate's real name was Chris. He also told me that Chris the pirate hadn't arrived yet. I wondered what else this Michael character might know, so I sat him down for questioning. I bought a bunch of pinball machines and I was actually going to make art out of them. <laughs> I worked at the Exploratorium and I just liked taking stuff apart and I, I liked building stuff. I'm Michael Sheese. I'm the founder and executive director of the Pacific Pinball Museum here in Alameda, California. I was going to retheme pinball machines. That was going to be my, latest, my newest art form. Um, and then it, it kind of got to where I, I felt like I was chopping a Duesenberg, you know? It was like hacking a piece of history that I probably shouldn't be messing with. And um, that's how I got more into, serious into the uh, pinball museum aspect of it. These days, I think, God, with everybody using their phones and playing Candy Crush and Angry Bird, it's like, this is almost a break from that. Yeah, I, think, I think the silver ball on, on the wood play field bouncing on the rubber using gravity is, is just all tangible and um, that's really appealing to people. Now we have Monday nights, kind of the camaraderie part where we all get together and work on the, on the machines and Chris was a huge part of that. I mean, because he, he's the one who said, well, let's, let's do it every Monday night and he's here every Monday night. The guy does this for a living. I, it's like, to me, it's incredible. As I ventured further into the depths of the museum, I was confronted by a known associate of the Pinball Pirate, a young corroborator by the name of Kyle, who challenged me to a guessing game. How many dollars? How many dollars of quarters? Dollars of quarters? Dollars of quarters? Dollars What's the value of the trade? Ooh, that's a tough one. I'm going to say, I'm going to go with 140. $140? Okay, that's the high side. I like that though, because sometimes you're, sometimes you'd be surprised. Got the quarter counter from the bank. Go with the, uh, the lever here, reset it all back to zero, and then we start. Yeah, who guessed, who guessed seven? I have no idea who guessed one. Chris did. Yeah, he did, he guessed 72. Wow, Chris is the winner. Chris, couldn't Chris is always the winner. I lost the game, but I didn't feel bad about it. The fact that Chris the Pirate had won meant he was somewhere in the museum. Now all I had to do was get this Kyle person to tell me where he was. My name is Kyle Spateri, and uh, I'm a technician at the Pacific Pinball Museum. It's a full-time job. Um, I work at the warehouse every day, taking care of the 1,400 games we have in our collection. You know, when I go to arcades, there is these pinball machines that no one was playing and there's all these video games that everyone was into and I just didn't care about them as much because I could play Super Mario when I was at home. So I just really fell in love with pinball because there's this, this magical world under glass. I'm lucky enough to be able to work with Chris Kuntz in his shop. You know, he's just a brilliant person and it's wonderful They're just learning how things are supposed to be, right? Because these machines are old now and you know, 30 years later, there's all sorts of stuff that aren't correct with them. They've been band-aid fixed and, you know, the bowling alley where they broke down. And, you know, it's neat seeing, learning from Chris, who was able to handle them when they were new to learn how things were supposed to be, and that's pretty wonderful. Following 
Following a tip from Kyle, I headed towards the museum's back room. I felt the pirate was close, but just as I entered the inner confines, I was stopped in the hallway near a vintage Coke machine by the museum's assistant director and muralist, Darcy, who had vital information about the pirate Chris. My name is Darcy. I'm the assistant director of the Pacific Pinball Museum here in beautiful Alameda. I saw this huge 10 foot by 10 foot mural of a game called Wonderland and it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. So I went around and I said, I have to meet the people who, you know, let you do this. I want to do this. I did my first mural in 2011. Pinball's a great teaching tool and it's also a way to bring, it brings generations together. Um, so you can come in here with your grandchild or your older brother or your whole family and everybody will have a pinball story. You know, I played it in the war, this game got me through my divorce, I met my wife at this league night, you know, they all have a story and pinball brings people together in a lot of ways. Northern California pinball. He's got schematics running through his veins. He doesn't have blood. He's got schematics. And I met Chris through Fix at Night and you know it took me a long time to sort of get close to him because I'm not a Fix It person so I had to ply him with uh, he likes Hawaiian pizza and he likes it cut in little slices so that was how I got my way into his heart. <laughs> As I marveled at the pinball murals hanging on the walls, a quick moving figure caught my eye. Had I finally found the pinball pirate? Was this the one they call Chris? Where was the eye patch, the hook, the peg leg? I moved closer to observe and found that, despite this figure's casually corporate appearance, the man had the speed and skill of a pirate. I watched him progress quietly and meticulously down a pinball repair sheet, moving from machine to machine and bringing back to life all manner of spring, flipper, bumper, sensor, and rod. I'd found the pirate, but by the time I was ready to make my move, fix it night at the pinball museum was over, and I'd lost Chris to the spoils of Hawaiian pizza and camaraderie. A day later, I obtained a communications connection to the pirate and politely asked if we could rendezvous at his lair. A map was quickly transcribed and I headed out once again, this time for an industrial hideout on the outskirts of Benicia, California. I caught the pinball pirate just as he was docking and wasn't surprised to find a hang glider attached to the top of his vessel. Pirates, as you know, are always prepared for a quick escape. Past the showroom, the pirate Chris opened the door to a layer of treasure that a 10-year-old me would not have believed existed. I asked the pirate if he had time for a few questions for my logbook, and he agreed. From underneath a bank of old arcade machine monitors burned in with the images of my youth, the pirate produced a brown vinyl throne that was once attached to a video poker machine. Perfect, I thought. Time to figure out who this Chris character really is. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Chris Koontz, and uh, I'm the Pinball Pirate. Uh, the name Pinball Pirate uh, I got from an interview with Tim Arnold. Tim Arnold is the original Pinball Pirate. Uh, he was a, uh, a teenager in Michigan. He bought a pinball machine, he put it in his garage, he started charging neighborhood kids to play it. Pretty soon he had another machine, and another machine he was charging kids to play them, which is fine, except the city came along and said, you can't do this here. I mean, if you want to do this, go pay rent somewhere, open an arcade, but we're not going to have you running this business out of your garage. He's like, fine, I will. So while he was in high school, he was running his own arcade. And he got into pinball at the right time, he got out at the right time, and he got back in at the right time. He said something he said, he said, all I ever wanted to be was a pinball pirate. He just wanted to do what he wanted to do, right? And he couldn't do it in his garage, so he went and did it. Uh, and nobody was going to tell him how to do it or what he could do. And he just, and that's kind of what it's like here. It's like, this is my, my little domain and, and I run it. And 
Chris Kuntz's lair was a mashup of sales floor, trophy room, mechanical sick bay, deep storage, and nostalgic wonderland. I tried not to touch anything, but it was hard with boxes labeled after things that defined 80s game culture. Impressed to say the least, I asked Chris how it all got started. Uh, my first memories of pinball were essentially looking up at the game like this and saying, well, that's not for me, and I'm only you know, two and a half, three years old. But at Lake Okoboji in Iowa, they had a ball bowler, which is, which were very common at the time. You had the, like the four inch ball, which was huge for a toddler. And, but the thing is that the deck is way down near the floor. So a three year old can play it. Uh, but then when I got to be tall enough, just tall enough to see over the glass on the machine, I go, wait a minute, there's a whole world under glass here that I've been missing out on. Uh, and so most of the places I played uh, pinball that time, uh, again, in Iowa, uh, was it uh, the Land of Oz, Arcade in the North Grand Shopping Center in Ames, Iowa. I remember Buccaneer and, and you know, Captain Fantastic and Superfly. They threw, I mean, pretty much every good machine went through that place. And so I played tons of video games. Then Pinball made us come back in the mid -80s. All right, great, I, I, can, I can enjoy Pinball again. Uh, by that point, and I, was, I was in college, uh, where they don't teach Pinball. Uh, when we moved to California, the first thing you did, because it was 1984, uh, was get out the yellow pages and see where's the arcade. And hey, here it is. Oh, I can walk, that's I, within walking distance. We can walk down there. So I was spending a lot of time at the arcade in Pleasanton as well. And if you're there all the time anyway, it's only a matter of time before somebody hands you a bottle of Windex and starts writing you a paycheck. While there's fame to be had as a pinball wizard and money as a tycoon operator, I wondered why Chris had opted for the role of cleric, of the person behind the players, the guy that keeps the games alive. Things that one, it pays the bills. Yeah, two, but I, I really like doing it. It's very satisfying to take something, especially something that's uh, like the machine I'm working on now that's kind of junky. This is something you can tell hasn't has sat somewhere for decades and you know, and it, you can see where other people tried to fix it or fixed it poorly and it's like, now nah, I'm gonna take it and do it all right. And not only that, but I, I pay attention to details, even details that don't matter, right? You know, like the belly leg bolts are their 916th drive and they have a very flat sort of acorn head, whereas the Williams were 5 and had this sort of, you know, domed acorn head and, and it doesn't, they both work. You could use, you could go to the hardware store and get an ugly flathead bolt and stick it in there and it would, it would hold the leg on, but it wouldn't be right. And it's, uh, does it matter? No. In another way, yes it does because I compare everything in my head to what the game is what's supposed to look like. Open it up and everything, it's like, oh, these are, these are round head screws instead of pan head. That's correct. You know, like somebody, somebody was paying attention. Somebody tried and somebody was putting everything back where it belonged and the game had an easier life. It's satisfying to take something like that that was, you know, one step away from the junk heap and turn it into something that somebody's going to enjoy and value. With the advent of smartphones, in-app purchases, and disposable games, I wondered what Chris thought about the future of pinball. Can it compete with the demands of the content culture? Video seems more disposable, right? Something, well, I have that on my phone. I have that on my home console. I don't need to store an object the size of a refrigerator to play one 8-bit game, uh, you know. But pinball, pinball you can't play on your phone. I mean, some people say, oh yeah, I have that. No, you don't. It's not really pinball. Uh, although some of the some of the approximations are pretty good, but it's nothing like the real thing. I've done this for too long uh, to say, oh, pinball is great and it's going to stay strong forever. Just that's not the way. It, the industry has always been cyclical. Uh, going back into the depression, it was just a depression was good for pinball. The industry is on a big upswing right now. Uh, it's uh, we do have multiple manufacturers making excellent machines, and for a while they were down. We were down to one manufacturer, no competition. It's better when you have competition. Everybody's trying to outdo each other. You see more and more amazing machines. Like anything else, it's not going to go up and up and up forever. And pinball takes over the world. It's just not. I mean, if it did, that would be kind of interesting. <laughs> a world run by pinball. Interesting indeed. I couldn't help but think the younger version of me would like that idea. I asked Chris what he thought the younger him would think about his profession as a pirate. I don't, the younger me wouldn't, I don't know that I would have been impressed by all the knowledge. The younger me would have been impressed with all the pinball machines, right? If, if you were to, if I go back in time and find young me and say, hey, when you're an adult, you're gonna own like a hundred pinball machines. I'm like, no way. But am I like some super rich guy or something? Like, no, you just own a hundred pinball machines. <laughs> oh, well, that's still pretty cool, I guess. Uh, yeah, but the knowledge is nice too, because if you own pinball machines, you, you, you know, you're gonna be fixing pinball machines, whether it's small things or larger things. As I left Chris's shop, I found myself wanting to go back. There was something familiar about it. 
It reminds me of Sam's Town in Cameron Park, birthday parties at Chuck E. Cheese, and hanging out in Davis, California, where inside an arcade, ironically named the library, I first escaped to Worlds Under Glass. They're, they're amazing machines. Uh, you're going to learn it if you give it a try. Uh, there's, if you don't like the newer machines, fine, go play some older machines. You can find us more than any other time in probably pinball history, you can find a greater number right now of older machines on location where you can put quarters in. Uh, most major metropolitan areas have some kind of map. And around here, it's the Bay Area pinball map. You can go online and say, oh, there's two machines at this bar here, there's six over at this place here, and there's two there, and people can comment on uh, are they well maintained? You know, what, what is the play pricing per machines? Are, you know, are there any leagues or tournaments there? Uh, so yes, you can find a place to go play pinball. Uh, if something doesn't work, let your local operator know if he wants to know about it so we can make it right.